everyone, Miss Go Electric here. Today is Sunday, January 18th, 2026, and this is the 98th consecutive episode of The Current, your weekly EV news in about 10 minutes. Before we begin, I want to take a quick moment to welcome thousands of new subscribers here on the main Miss Go Electric channel who made their way here from our industry channel this week. As promised, we wrapped up and published our Donut Lab Solid State Battery and Verge Motorcycle CEO interview videos on that channel, and we are thrilled at the reception that work has received so far. If you're new and would like to learn even more about our background and the full breadth of electric transportation coverage on our network of channels, you can click here and see the link in our video's description to a video called Meet Miss Go Electric. I also want to thank our existing subscriber base for continuing to engage and support our content by hitting the hype button, commenting, sending super thanks, sharing links, and joining our paid membership program. We recognized many regulars from The Current in the comments of those solid state battery videos, reiterating your love for our content, and we greatly appreciate that. This is a strong start to 2026, and we hope to only improve and grow more with lots more super exciting content coming your way. All right, let's dive into this week's EV news already. California's governor has proposed a new state budget for the 2026-2027 fiscal year that includes $200 million set aside for a one-time funding allocation for a light-duty zero-emission vehicle incentive. This initiative aims to provide rebates or point-of-sale discounts to help Californians purchase or lease EVs, stepping in to offset the loss of the federal $7,500 tax credit for new EVs, which expired in late 2025. The proposal comes amid a reported decline in EV sales following the end of federal incentives, and it fulfills the governor's earlier pledge to backfill that support at the state level. The funding would be administered by the California Air Resources Board, also known as CARB, building on the now-closed Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, which distributed nearly $1.5 billion in incentives for more than a half a million EVs before concluding in 2023. Details on the new program structure, such as exact rebate amounts per vehicle, eligible criteria including potential income requirements or a focus on low and moderate income buyers, and any MSRP caps are still under development and will be finalized through CARB's program design process, potentially in partnership with automakers. The budget also faces a projected deficit and requires approval from the state legislature, where negotiations could lead to adjustments such as prioritizing incentives for used EVs or disadvantaged communities. The limited one-time allocation means the program with finite resources may operate on a first-come, first-served basis. Budgets are usually revised and finalized by the state legislature in the summer. California is home to the U.S.'s largest automotive market, selling 1.7 million light-duty passenger vehicles per year, and nearly 30% of their sales are all-electric vehicles. It has been the state with the most battery electric vehicle registrations since 2016, with over two million EVs on the road today. Our northern neighbor, Canada, has reached a significant trade agreement with China, which opens the door for some Chinese electric vehicles to be sold in the country, marking a major policy shift. Prime Minister Mark Carney announced the deal during a visit to Beijing this past week, describing it as a preliminary but landmark pact that establishes a new strategic partnership between the two nations. The agreement slashes Canada's existing 100% tariff on Chinese EVs, imposed in 2024, to a most favored nation rate of 6.1%. It introduced a managed quota system, allowing up to 49,000 Chinese EVs to be imported annually at the reduced rate, with the cap increasing to 70,000 vehicles by the fifth year. In exchange, China has agreed to lower its retaliatory tariffs on Canadian canola seed from around 85% to approximately 15% by March 1st, while removing duties on other products like lobster, crabs, and peas through at least the end of the year. The deal aims to boost Canadian agriculture exports and diversify trade amid strained relations with the United States. The decision has drawn criticism from U.S. officials who call it 
problematic and warned Canada might regret it, citing concerns over protecting domestic auto industries from subsidized Chinese imports. This move breaks from alignment with protectionist policies in the U.S., where high tariffs and restrictions continue to block most Chinese EVs from the market. General Motors, Ford, Stellantis, Toyota, and Honda each have manufacturing plants in Canada, along with some supporting EV materials and components facilities that we've reported on. The average vehicle transaction price in Canada last year was about 63 to 64,000 Canadian dollars. The country recorded nearly 1.9 million vehicles sold in 2025, so even at the cap of 70,000 per year in five years, that is only about three to 4% of the market. The Canadian EV market dropped in 2025 due to the expiration of ZEV credits, and those figures have not yet been published. But a total of 200,000 all-electric models were sold in 2024 in Canada, which accounted for 11% of the market. The import cap could have been established in terms of total value, which would have incentivized China to import the maximum quantity of low-cost EVs. Instead, it was set by unit quantity, which is likely to result in higher cost EVs with maximum profit opportunity for China, as well as a recalibration of public sentiment regarding the quality and performance of top-end Chinese offerings. Like the U.S. market, pickup trucks and SUVs dominated Canadian passenger vehicle sales in 2025, accounting for over 87% of total new vehicle sales, with the Ford F-Series claiming the title for most sold in the country, followed by the Toyota RAV4, GMC Sierra, Honda CRV, and Chevy Silverado. We would not be surprised to see several long-range all-electric crossovers enter the market by BYD like their Sea Lion 06 and Song L, or NEO with their ES6, and even Xiaomi with the YU7, and be considered desirable in Canada, especially considering their cold winter climate. In combination with Canada's recent trade deal with China and General Motors' announcement of further investment in Mexico with a $1 billion commitment through 2027, this could plausibly add pressure on the U.S. administration to reconsider or push for changes to the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, on trade. The USMCA is currently under formal review, with a key decision point by July 1st, where the U.S., Canada, and Mexico must agree to extend it for another 16 years, renegotiate the terms, or let it enter a phase of annual reviews, potentially leading to expiration in 2036. While the U.S. president was in Detroit last week, he was asked about China importing their EVs into the U.S. and responded, if they want to come in and build a plant and hire you and hire your friends and your neighbors, that's great. I love that. Let China come in. Let Japan come in. All three major Japanese automakers already have manufacturing plants in the U.S. Currently, just one major Chinese-owned automaker, Geely, owns an auto manufacturing plant in the U.S. A gradual introduction of Chinese EVs into Canada could add more pressure to legacy North American automakers to speed up development of globally competitive and compelling EV options. Even amid EV investment pullbacks, General Motors CEO Mary Barra reiterated earlier this week that her company's stance is that EVs are still the end game for the auto industry. Things are heating up. How do you think this will play out? Let us know what you think in the comments. Honda unveiled a new prototype travel trailer called the Base Station, marking the automaker's entry into a towable RV market with a design optimized for electric vehicles and compact SUVs. The lightweight Base Station prototype weighs under 1,500 pounds, making it towable by popular models like the Honda CRV or Honda's all-electric Prologue SUV without significantly impacting range. For off-grid capability, the trailer includes an integrated lithium-ion battery, inverter, and roof-mounted solar panels. It also features a modular design with removable side panels that can be swapped for accessories such as an external kitchen, shower, air conditioning, or awning. The trailer includes a pop-up roof to offer seven feet of standing headroom. The interior is simple with a fold-out couch that converts to a queen bed and an optional bunk. While currently a prototype, Honda indicates strong intent to bring it to market. No firm production timeline has been announced. Honda wasn't the only one with electric travel trailer news. 
Harbinger, the American manufacturer known for its electric and hybrid medium-duty vehicles, has unveiled Harbinger Industria, a new business unit expanding its high-performance battery technology beyond automotive applications into energy storage and auxiliary power solutions. The first implementation of their new business unit comes in the form of a collaboration with iconic travel trailer brand Airstream, who will become the first customer to integrate Harbinger's technology. At the Florida RV Super Show in Tampa this week, Airstream unveiled its new Tradewind 27FB travel trailer, which incorporates the Harbinger power system. This setup delivers up to 18.5 kilowatt hours of battery capacity using Panasonic cells, supports solar integration, and features a 5,000 watt inverter for off-grid performance. As many of you know, we are fans of electric recreational vehicles. In fact, we published several reviews and walkthroughs on electric travel trailers and camper vans, including the Pebble Flow, Grounded RV G3, and Lightship AE1, plus a factory tour at Lightship. We've also included those links in this video's description. Speaking of electric fun, Land Moto, the Cleveland, Ohio-based electric motorcycle producer, has expanded its lineup with the debut of the District ADV, its first purpose-built adventure dual sport model designed for both on-road and off-road riding. The District ADV weighs just 240 pounds and features their upgraded Enduro Evo mid-drive electric powertrain with 23 horsepower and 375 newton meters of torque and a top speed of over 70 miles per hour in performance mode. There are three battery options running at 72 volts, including the most capacious at 4.8 kilowatt hours, offering up to 110 miles of range. They will all offer regenerative braking, a first for land, as well as a reverse function. Key off-road enhancements include long travel fully adjustable suspension with 7.5 inches or 190 millimeters of travel up front and around 4 inches or 100 millimeters of travel in the rear. It also includes 9 inches of ground clearance, aggressive dual sport tires, rally inspired bodywork with wind protection, and a new full color TFT dashboard. The standard District ADV starts at $11,200, with deliveries expected in Q2 of 2026. A limited production Ascent Edition with premium features like forged carbon bodywork and gold anodized components is available at $12,700, with shipments beginning Q1 of 2026. Pre-orders are now open on the company's website. I'll link the site below. Land will compete head to head with the $8,000 outset dual sport bike from California's Rivid Motorcycles, which is available now. I published a super detailed review of Rivid's street bound Anthem motorcycle over at the Misco Electric Ride Reviews channel, and I'll share that link too. This afternoon, Sunday, January 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, producer Tim and I are looking forward to hosting the third episode of The Live Wire here on YouTube. We plan to broadcast for about an hour, unpacking these stories and answering questions from channel members and subscribers in the live chat. We assume a lot of people will want to discuss more regarding the Donut Lab Solid State Battery video and Verge CEO interview. Both will be on the end screen, so you can watch those next. We'll try to limit that part of the conversation to 20 minutes or less. Leave your comments and questions in the video too, and we'll select a couple to address on air. This week, we also published our in-depth review of the Event in Solterra 3 that was just unveiled. If you've been looking for a lightweight, carbon belt equipped, stealthy electric road bike, you may want to check it out. I'll link that below as well. As a reminder, if you would like to support the work we do, please consider subscribing to all of our channels and join this channel's membership program. Members gain access to the current as soon as we finish editing it. Members also get exclusive content, a merchandise discount, and other perks. This week, we'll also be publishing an incredible extended version of our CES coverage loaded with insightful interviews for members and a condensed version publicly. Thank you for joining us this week, and until next time, drive, fly, ride. Go electric.